Well, it looks like we're at that time. So I'm going to say aloha, everyone, and welcome to a special presentation hosted by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council on education versus enforcement, next steps beyond the enactment of Hawaii's sunscreen law. And we're all very excited that you're here. I'm Darla Palmer Ellingson, your MC, and I'm also the host of local radio show uh, and public affairs programming, Island Environment 360. And that's Maui's only commercially broadcast public affairs show on, on the environment and related Hawaiian cultural topics. And it airs on all of H Hawaii media stations. Tonight's presentation is part of Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's monthly Know Your Ocean Speaker Series, usually held on the first Wednesday of each month at 5.30 on Zoom. This month's series is supported by the County of Maui Mayor's Office of Economic Development. A few things before we get going, you'll notice that your microphone is on mute and please keep it on mute during the presentation to avoid distractions. We have two presenters today, and we'll hear from each of them in turn, and then we'll have a Q&A session to answer your questions. During the presentation, you are welcome to submit questions as you think of them by using the Q&A button that you'll find by mousing over the lower edge of your screen, and I'll be reading from them during the Q&A session. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters. Dr. Craig Downs, whose groundbreaking research educated the world about sunscreen chemicals and their ro role in coral reefs decline, and Hawaii Senator Mike Gabbard, who authored the legislation that resulted in Hawaii's ban on the sale of sunscreens that contain the chemicals oxybenzone and Octan, octanizate. Sorry about that. We will hear from Dr. Craig Downs first and then Senator Gabbard. <clears throat> I'm pleased to tell you about our first speaker, Dr. Craig Downs. Craig Downs graduated from Hiram College with a BA in philosophy and biology, received his master's of science from Syracuse University, received his PhD from the University of Hawaii in cell and molecular biology. He's published over 50 scientific papers and has a number of books and chapters in scientific textbooks and is the co-editor of the CRC Press veterinary book, Diseases of Corals. Dr. Downs has also founded a number of companies and nonprofits relating anywhere from animal welfare to environmental conservation and exploration. Downs has held positions as research professor at the University of Hawaii School of Medicine and Sweetbriar College. He is currently an invited professor at the Sorbonne University in France and is the executive director of Oh boy, <laughs> um, I'm going to have to let him uh, explain that. Environmental Laboratory, a nonprofit scientific organization dedicated to the increasing scientific, social, and economic knowledge of natural environmental habitats in order to better conserve and restore threatened environmental habitats and resources. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Craig Downs to our Zoom stage. Welcome, Dr. Downs. Aloha, and thank you for having me. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't ask you about the, the laboratory that you're working with. You can, you can help me out with that. It's uh, hereticus. It's the root word for heresy. Okay, I should not have dropped out of Latin, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so if you want me to start right into it, um, let's go to the, the first slide. Oh. <laughs> Craig, I have it pulled up. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it. Um, okay. So let's go ahead to, to the next slide. Great. So um, the topic really begins with tourism and over tourism. And over tourism is basically when a tourist spot gets too many people um, for what's good for that location and what's really good for that society. 
So all over the world, we're seeing these effects of overtourism. Hawaii is kind of a famous place for overtourism. It's used uh, abundantly as an example in media. Next slide. And when you're looking at thousands upon thousands of people on a beach and in the water, most folks think that there's nothing going on, that there's no environmental degradation, there's no environmental effect. Um, it's just people having a good time enjoying themselves on the beach and enjoying the water. Um, but you need to look closer because oftentimes that's not the case. Um, next, next slide. So what we're finding, uh, a lot of scientists around the world, is where we're seeing these heavily um, visited tourist spots, the, the environment has degraded um, tremendously. This spot right here is from Trunk Bay in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And 40 years ago, before tourists really hit the islands, it was a, a lovely place. It was one of the first snorkel coral reef tours, pathways um, in the world. And, and now it's 95% gone of their coral reefs. Um, next slide. And so that environmental degradation, along with the, the normal anxiety and stress that tourists, especially intensive tourism, um, brings to a place, has caused a backlash by locals. And this, this is called over-tourism. And this backlash is palpable. Um, so I go over to Europe a lot before COVID. And you would see the signs of asking the tourists to jump off their balconies in Barcelona and, and in Madrid and in parts of France, because there's just so many people. Uh, next slide. We see it here in Maui. Um, again, before the COVID lockdown, um, we were seeing um, over tourism on Kauai. Um, in, in Maui news, there was a headline of, of basically Maui County being an overworked brothel um, and county council really discussing how do we manage uh, this impact? Because there has to be a balance between um, sustainable tourism and um, sust uh, uh, sustainable ecosystems. Um, and if you don't have that balance, then not only do the ecosystems go away, but the tourists will go away. Next slide, please. So I wanna give you an example of what happens when you get this over tourism. And we won't pick any, um, we won't pick on any spots in Hawaii. What I'll show is Maya Bay in Thailand. So Maya Bay is about a 23, 25 acre bay. It's an enclosed bay. Um, many of you might've seen it if you're older in uh, some of the James Bond movies. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio filmed the beach at, at this location. Uh, next slide. And in 2015, it saw 1.5 million visitors. And then in 2018, it saw 2.5 million visitors. So that's 2.5 million visitors in a 23-acre spot. Is it having an impact? Next slide. Just from the visible refuse trash, um, all the plastic bottles, the, the park service there was hauling away between 28 and 44 tons of garbage, mostly plastic water bottles and sunscreen bottles out of Maya Bay. Um, and as you can see here, it's, it's just loaded. The beach can oftentimes be loaded with marine plastic debris. Next slide. It also had an issue of all those people being there and what do you do about sewage? And so it's been estimated between 1,500 and 4,500 gallons of raw sewage per day is released into Maya Bay. So how safe are those waters just for humans to swim in? Not, it's not really safe. Next slide. And it's not safe because there are things in sewage, chemicals in sewage um, besides just bacteria that can have a, a detrimental effect to coral reefs and seagrass beds in Maya Bay. Next slide. And one of these things that we think is a major factor for the stress are the tourists who are using sunscreen. And as you can see, most of these tourists are 
lighter skinned individuals and they're going to be putting sunscreen on about 50 to 70% of their body. Um, and so Maya Bay has about 5,000 swimmers per day at a minimum. And if you calculate that each visitor will stay there for four hours, they'll put 72 grams of sunscreen on their bodies um, during those, those, four hour, those four hours. And most of it will wash off into the bay. And so we can kind of do a back of the envelope calculation that there is about 360 kilograms of sunscreen lotion going into Maya Bay on an average day. And one of the sunscreen chemicals that, that was been banned in uh, Hawaii, oxybenzone, um, you know, we, they, they see about 8,500 pounds of oxybenzone in that 23 acre bay per year. And the bay was just dying. Um, about 80% of the coral reefs have disappeared, the seagrass beds have disappeared, and most of the fish and wildlife had just, just escaped from the bay. There was just nothing there. It'd become a, an ecological desert. Next slide. So what did Thailand do? They closed it. And they closed it, and I believe it is still closed for an indefinite amount of period, an indefinite period. It's been closed for about a year and a half. Um, so no one's coming there and they're trying to create management plans that will allow for sustainable tourist use of this area. Next slide. During this closure, um, where there were no people allowed, the return of wildlife was phenomenal. And I think most Hawaiians living in Hawaii will have noticed the same thing to the beaches and to the coral reefs in Hawaii as a result of the COVID lockdown. No tourists coming in and out of the island. Uh, for example, I've heard that Hanama Bay's water has, has turned from gray to a beautiful blue. Uh, lots of places are now seeing limu all over the shoreline. Uh, fish are coming back. And so they saw this, this same effect. Um, regrowth of coral, no trash, the sand is clean. Um, fish and sharks were coming back. Next slide. So the big question is with this tourism, with this over tourism, what is the ecological problem? And what we're seeing, as I've said, next slide, is just this slow degradation of, of, of coral reefs. Now, this is a picture of a coral reef going back to 1975. It's in the Florida Keys. And I want you to take a look at this slide. So in 1975, we see big coral reefs. And then over a, the, a period of, of 25, 30 years, those corals have just eroded away. Um, so we're, we're seeing coral death. But the other thing that we're not seeing here is we're not seeing small corals coming in. And so in the past, uh, basically like during the 1940s and 1950s in many of these coral reef areas, a hurricane will come through and it'll just flatten a coral reef. It'll look like Cary's Fort Reef in 2014. But within 10 years time, biodiversity comes back um, double to what it was before the, the hurricane came in and flattened. And so we're not seeing that rejuvenation. We're not seeing that restoration. Uh, we're just seeing the slow decline. And so this is the big problem. Next slide. The big problem is, again, we should see healthy coral, uh, regenerating coral, new coral, um, new fish, older fish. And instead, what we're seeing in these coastal areas that are, that are highly visited by tourists is just a really high death rate and almost no recruitment of, of the next generation. Next slide. Most scientists and most folks would just focus in on the death. And, and that's, it, it is a serious issue. You know, all these individuals, coral colonies are dying, the fish are disappearing. Um, but something else that we discovered, um, it's called coral reef zombies. And we're finding out that the corals that are there, the fish that are there, the sea urchins that are there, they're not reproductively viable. And this, this, this sterility, occurs before we see the major death. And so we'll see these coral reefs like at Hanaloa Bay, 
um, like at uh, Honakiana Bay uh, back in 2011, um, you know, a healthy coral reef, uh, something happens, a sedimentation event, things die, and we're not seeing any type of recruitment. And why is that? And we think it's partially because of these chemicals causing sterility in many different types of organisms. Next slide. So one of the things we we're asking ourselves as scientists is, is our sunscreens and the chemicals in those sunscreens poisoning the ocean? Next slide. So everybody's uh, pretty familiar with sunscreen, especially the, the, the aerosol spray application kind. Um, you know, some of it gets on your body and most of it goes to the wind. Uh, what's actually in these sunscreen um, products? Next slide. Nowadays, especially if you see a, a petrochemical sunscreen um, that is SPF 50 or 70 or 100, you can see that over 50% of the content of that product is sunscreens and different petrochemicals of sunscreens or mineral sunscreens, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. And what we want to focus on on this one is just for right now is oxybenzone. So oxybenzone is allowed in, in U.S. sunscreens at a uh, concentration of no more than 6%. Next slide, please. And we've known for at least 10, uh, 12 years that sunscreen itself can be highly toxic. So if you just take some sunscreen from a bottle, and you have some corals in a beaker and you add a little bit of that sunscreen um, product into the beaker, you can get a bleaching effect or you can get mass mortality. Um, and anybody can repeat this that has a laboratory. Um, I think in 2018 and 2019, I had over a thousand students from across the country wanting to do something like this for their science fair projects. And we mostly had them focus on doing this experiment uh, so they can see for themselves using grass or uh, green uh, algae, um, aquatic algae. And they saw it, they saw that it was toxic. Next slide. And so over the last five, six years, um, we've, a number of groups, not just my laboratory, but a number of laboratories have been showing that oxybenzone can cause DNA damage. It can uh, deform planula. It can cause corals to bleach. Next slide. But what's kind of ignored by most of the politics, most of the media, and even by the scientific community is what it does to fish. And oxybenzone can be toxic to um, uh, the larval state of fish, the embry embryonic state of fish. It's also an endocrine disruptor. And so it can change the behavior of male fish and being less aggressive and less um, willing to mate. Next slide. And if you have oxybenzone at a high enough concentration in the water, it can cause a dysfunction. Um, it can stop a, a biological process called sequential hermaphrodism. And this is where species of fish like clownfish, moray eels, parrotfish, um, in a bay, they'll all be female except a single male. When that single male dies, it's caught by a fisher person or it's, it's you know, eaten by a shark, the alpha female, the next, the, the female that's, that's highest in the um, pecking order, will sense that the male has disappeared from their, from their environment and she will transition into being the male for that population. Oxybenzone stops that from happening. And so this is an example, a process in which we, we were starting to see these, these coral reef zombies appearing, um, basically because the population is not able to reproduce. There's no males. Next slide. We also know, and a lot of people know, that spray aerosol spray sunscreen can be incredibly toxic to your lawn. A lot of golf courses will, will prohibit aerosol sun, uh, sunscreen application on the greens because it does just this. It's, it's an herbicide. Oxybenzone is, is actually herbicidal in property. What does that mean to, uh, to our coral reefs and, and to Hawaiians? Next slide. 
because oxybenzone can be toxic to seagrasses and the algae as low as 10 parts per trillion, it kills the lemur. And so this impact, um, this, this death of lemur um, means that green sea turtles don't have a place to feed. Um, and it also means that people who enjoy or subsistence on, on, on lemu for food, they can't find it. They have to go far away to areas that are a bit more treacherous to go collect their lemu. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this, um, this subject is what is the interaction of climate change and sunscreen pollution has been kind of a big topic in the last three, four years. and a uh, a, a group, a uh, Finnish group, a Belgian group in uh, Europe discovered that oxybenzone decreases the temperature which corals bleach and it, it decreases um, or it increases the mortality that corals will see at lower temperatures. So there is a big interaction between climate change. Other groups have now, uh, now studying the interaction between oxybenzone and ocean acidification, um, uh, oxybenzone and uh, hyposalinity events. You get more storms, you get more fresh wa water intrusion. Um, hyposalinity can cause corals to bleach. Oxybenzone makes them more susceptible to those climatic events. Next slide. Now we'll just go ahead and to the next slide after this. Next slide. Um, no, sorry, go back one. The, uh, somebody asked me, what is the interaction between uh, marine plastics and oxybenzone? And this has been a really hot field in the past year and a half. Uh, a number of scientific groups have found that microplastics um, that are formed either as a result of, of, of uh, a microplastic beads being in your sunscreen product or in your shampoo and your conditioner or soaps, it gets out in the ocean or weathering of marine plastic debris, what happens is that oxybenzone and other petrochemical sunscreen um, sunscreens will bind to those plastic particles. And if they're microplastics, um, just click on once. Oh, sorry, must not be going. Go ahead and click, uh, go back, sorry. Um, corals, for some reason, think plastic microbeads are like bubble tea. They're absolutely delicious and, and corals like to consume microplastics. So they're now consuming microplastics that could have high concentrations of oxybenzone and other pesticides and other pharmaceuticals on those plastics. And so when they consume them, we're, we see that they're much more susceptible to bleaching, to becoming zombies. Um, a, what, a study that's coming out showing that uh, oxybenzone is a neurotoxin and it causes corals to slow down their feeding. Um, uh, another study that should be coming out soon is showing that long-term exposure to oxybenzone makes their skeleton weaker. Um, and of course, oxybenzone is an endocrine disruptor for both fish and corals. Um, they're seeing this not just in corals, but also in oysters, clams, and gastropods. Next slide. So what are the solutions that can be ecologically significant? Next slide. One of the biggest things that um, environmental groups can do, governments can do, is educate the public on this matter. Um, and so one of the, the first major educators was Jeff Bagshaw at a Hee Natural Air Reserve, and he's been leading the way um, since I think 2015. Um, uh, the National Park Service has also launched a campaign, and now we see similar campaigns all over the world from uh, Croatia and Russia to Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, and it kind of began all right here on Maui with, with Jeff. Next slide. That public education um, influences consumer choices and consumer choices and preferences can affect retail policy. So in the last four years, we've seen a huge shift in major retailers eliminating oxybenzone and actinosate sunscreen brands even before Hawaii passed the law in 2018. Uh, and now it's become a huge consumer uh, uh, marketing preference or brand of something called blue beauty or clean beauty, where you choose 
personal care products from shaving creams to deodorants that have um, a low impact to, to, to the environment. Next slide. The sunscreen industry has actually um, kind of uh, arisen to the occasion and a number of popular brands, Ocean Potion, um, uh, Hawaiian Tropic have, have tried to reformulate their sunscreens um, the, the funniest one that I saw is Nivea, which is owned by a big German company that just bought Coppertone. This picture of Nivea, which is the Nivea sun um, image, uh, was taken in on a beach in Slovenia. And as you can see here, the sticker that is on all the Nivea bottles is, is that it's compliant with the Hawaiian Reef Bill, and it's free of octinoxate and oxybenzone. Um, so this is great. We, we see the sunscreen industry moving to formulate safer products. But I started my career, unfortunately, in oil spills, like the Exxon Valdez oil spill and, and other oil spills. And an oil historian once told me that the oil industry is only as good as its regulations. Um, just click the, the spacer button. OK, good. So. And this is where Senator Gabbard will, will lead off on is we need regulations. The industry needs regulations because even if industry uses these um, goodwill um, slogans as part of their marketing um, brand, it, you, you need to have the regulations to ensure that these changes are permanent and persistent. And even more so, these regulations are critical for getting industry out of its um, stasis. Uh, many of these sunscreen chemicals were invented before World War II. Homo salate, which is one of them, uh, which can be used up to 15% in a sunscreen, was actually invented and first used as a UV protectant for Greece in World War II fighter planes. It was not really meant to be used on the skin, um, but that's what we use it for now, 15%. So these regulations can spur or inspire innovation in industry. Next slide. And there's a, a whole new field of green chemistry that's just kind of exploded literally in the last six, seven months where they're finding these new UV sunscreens from the organisms out in the environment, from algae, from corals. Um, there's a UV, uh, there's a UV, sunscreen ingredient that's been patented in Australia that came from corals, uh, botanicals, a new type of ceramics. Um, so these laws are pushing industry to, to create more um, safer and more effective sunscreens. Next slide. The other thing that we push for is, as you see here with the baby, the, the baby's torso is just covered with mineral sunscreen, and that's great. Um, but we recommend um, as a conservation measure for people to put on a sun shirt. So if you cover up your torso and arms with a, a UPF uh, shirt, a UPF means universal uh, protection factor. Um, so if you see something that is a UPF 50 shirt, it has 98% sun protection against both UVA and UVB. Um, radiation, but that sun shirt means you're not putting sunscreen on your chest and on your arms. And that reduces the amount of sunscreen um, pollution that goes in the ocean because you're not having to put it on yourself. So one of the biggest things that an individual can do for ecological conservation is just dress up. Um, use sunscreen on your face, you know, on the back of your legs, but Wear a sun shirt when you're going out, when you're at the beach. Next slide, please. Um, niche marketing, marketing and, and targeted distribution. So this is where the tourism industry itself, um, the, the tourist boats that bring people out to Molokini, um, the resorts um, can actually have a, a major impact in ecological conservation and reducing sunscreen pollution by informing their guests 
that hey you know use a, a a safer sunscreen use a mineral sunscreen um you know put on a sun shirt um you know so so the tourist industry itself can be one of the biggest um uh, catalysts for creating this ecological conservation against sunscreen pollution um thereby allowing for tourism to come in and, and actually be sustainable next slide what is the the what's the carbon footprint of all that sunscreen packaging um so everybody has gone into um stores that are right there near the beach and it's the first uh display when you go into their store it's mostly plastic bottles so one of the things that industry can do is get rid of the plastic bottles and even the metal bottles the like the aluminum uh, bottles they're coated on the inside with an epoxy so it's still a plastic um next slide so um, many of these sunscreens can be packaged in sustainable packaging whether they may, may be uh, made from wood you know uh, such as bamboo from glass uh, from from wax paper, um, I think Little Hands in on um, the Big Island. They they um, it's a sunscreen company. I think most of their products are all um, cardboard packaging. So it's again, it's a way of cr creating a sustainable product. Um, next slide. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, so in the Republic of Palau, uh, President Tommy uh, Remanguso um, passed a law that was one of the most comprehensive bans on, on, on sunscreens and personal care products. Uh, they pretty much banned all the petrochemical, petrochemical sunscreens as well as most of the the chemical preservatives that are that are used, such as parabens. Um, and he's quoted as saying that coral reefs and other natural resources cannot drive future economies if they do not survive, and they cannot survive without prompt action. Industry innovation is essential in finding a solution for the practical problems posed by emerging environmental pollutants. And he's not speaking just about the personal care product industry, it's also the tourism industry. Government must be more effective in protecting the environment and industry must be its top partner. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. I have just unmuted myself here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Downs. And, you know, I, I was just kind of curious. You talk a lot about um, oxytinazate and oxybenzone. And, um, you know, what about all the other chemicals that, that were on that? sunscreen label. Um, I can imagine that's not very helpful either. No, they, they aren't. Um, and so what we're seeing is a decrease of oxybenzone and actinosate or octinoxate in the Hawaiian Islands, but we're seeing a massive increase of environmental contamination of the other sunscreen chemicals like octocrylene, avobenzone, and those come with their own environmental issues. Um, for example, octocrylene is also an endocrine disruptor. It's a reproductive um, disruptor, and it breaks down into a chemical called benzophenone, which is a known carcinogen, uh, which is banned by the FDA. Um, so many of those chemicals um, truly need to be managed. Um, and if it means um, legislatively managed, I think there is a strong argument for that. Okay, well, thank you so much and stick around because we do have questions coming in from the audience, uh, but I did want to um, turn now to our next speaker, which is Hawaii Senator Mike Gabbard. Senator Gabbard represented District 20 since 2006 or has represented since 2006 which includes Kapiolei, Makakilo, portions of Kailoa, uh, 
Waipahu and Eva, and has authored 54 bills that became law related to energy efficiency, renewable energy, endangered species protect protection, industrial hemp, the environment, public safety, and more. And one of those bills became law in 2018, that's SB 2571, uh, was the ban of the sale and distribution in the state of any sunscreen containing oxybenzone or octinazate um, or both. Uh, and that law went into effect on January 1st, 2021. Last session, Gabbard introduced SB 366, which would be the sale offer, uh, offer of sale or distribution in Hawaii of any sunscreen that contains two or more chemicals um, and that, that includes ovobenzone and uh, octocrylene. Um, so please join me in welcoming Senator Gabbard to the Zoom stage. Welcome. Aloha and mahalo, uh, Darla. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, Darla, mahalo for introducing me as Senator Gabbard. Uh, most people introduce me as Tulsi's dad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, when you got a kid who's running for president of the United States, your life changes in many ways, and that's one of them. I, I can imagine. Thank you so much <laughs> for being here. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with you today uh, to discuss a very important issue that affects not only our coral reefs, but our entire island paradise. But before I begin, I want to give a, uh, a big mahalo to the uh, Maui Nui Marine Resource Council for inviting me to speak and for their commitment to keeping our coral reefs and oceans safe. I also want to mahalo Dr. Craig Downs for not only joining me on today's panel, but for his efforts uh, throughout the years in addressing a very important issue that affects our island home. And lastly, I want to mahalo all of you who are tuning in. I know that there are many other things that you could be doing, uh, but you've decided to be here now. Uh, you made this event, this discussion, this issue a priority today. So for that, I want to say mahalo. But I want you to imagine, what if we decided to make this topic a priority, not just for today, but a priority for tomorrow and the day after that and so on? What if more people decided for themselves that this is a priority and decided to actually do something about it? You see, we all deserve a, a clean and healthy environment, including flourishing coral reefs and marine life. However, we all must do our part. Uh, Hawaii is home to, uh, to all of us coming together, working together, and that's what it's going to take to get the job done. And that's what's going to lead us to a better Hawaii for all. Uh, this is a huge issue for me personally. I consider our oceans and coral reefs part of our community. And so it's important that we take care of our community. I've been the committee chair of environment related subject matter in the state Senate for 12 years. And I was an environmentalist before I became an elected official. You may not know this, but it was in it was 1996 that my daughter Tulsi and I, we, we formed a nonprofit called Hawaii Healthy Hawaii Coalition. And over 6,000 students in 60 schools statewide have participated in uh, HHC's uh, the Hawaii Watershed Experience, as we call it, which includes uh, very popular field trips for the kids. And the curriculum teaches students the ahupua'a concept of taking care of the watershed from the top of the mountain to the sea. And now as a former educator, I'm well aware of how valuable our teachers are to our keiki. Uh, there's power that comes from effective education. And with that power, we can not only inform, we can inspire. So part of our efforts in helping make our Hawaii a, a better place is to ensure that the best education is being offered. So groups such as the Maui Nui Marine Resource Council is doing just that. So circling back to the issue at hand today, uh, it was 2018, Hawaii became the first jurisdiction in the entire world to ban the sale of sunscreen that contains two very dangerous chemicals, oxybenzone and octanoxate. And when we were working on our landmark first in the world legislation to ban these dangerous chemicals, the science told us that these chemicals were a threat to our coral reefs. And our coral reefs are an integral part of our having a healthy ocean ecosystem. And the fact is 
you know, they're definitely under threat from runoff, wastewater, and the impacts of, of climate change. So although we were able to ban the sale of sunscreens containing oxybenzone and octanoxate, our job is far from over. The truth is our coral reefs are in danger. And the question is, what are we gonna do about it? So for my portion of this discussion today, uh, I'm gonna split it up into three parts. The first part will be uh, Act 104 of 2018. Uh, that's the ban of, uh, sale ban of oxybenzone and octanoxate. Then I'll talk about SB 132 of 2021. Uh, that's the octocrylene and uh, avobenzone sale ban effort. And then the third part, I'll talk about our next steps. So to start, let's get back, go back in time to 2015. And so during this time, of course, there weren't things such as mandatory mask wearing or six feet social distancing. But, um, you know, stadiums and, and concert venues were packed, homes were filled for special gatherings and, and Hawaii had seen another record breaking year in tourism. And also in that year, as well as the year before, 50%, 5-0, of our coral reefs were lost worldwide because of coral bleaching. And the main factor that has contributed to the decline of our coral reefs is localized pollution, such as sewage, pesticide runoff, and yes, chemical sunscreens. Uh, we looked at some data, according to the US National Park Service, more than 6,000 tons of sunscreen end up in Hawaiian waters every year. Our state DLNR, Department of Land and Natural Resources, reported that 55, now listen to this Maui, 55 gallons of sunscreen were going into our near shore waters each day on Maui, Maui alone. And so with this volume of chemical sunscreens pouring into our oceans and in areas like Kapalua and Hanauma Bay, of course, our reefs aren't going to have next to no chance of recovery. And so as it relates to human health, thanks to Dr. Downs and others, we learned that these chemicals are linked to causing breast cancer to become more aggressive, polluting breast milk, uh, causing a Hirschsprung deformity in newborns, um, are associated with women's uh, uterine diseases, uh, threaten male sexual health, and can also damage your DNA. And so as you can see, the thing that many thought was there for their own protection, was in fact causing more harm than good. And so the two main chemicals addressed, as mentioned earlier, oxybenzone and octanoxate. So let's move forward to 2017. So it's during the 2017 legislative session, uh, there were several oxybenzone related bills that were introduced, but they all ultimately failed. And it was after that session that there was an ad hoc group of environmental groups and scientists called the Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition or HIROC they formed. I participated in some of their meetings uh, with the group and, and what would come to be Act 104 became one of the group's key priorities for the 2018 session. So I was asked by the group to take the lead on introducing this important piece of legislation. And uh, when uh, 2018 session rolled around in mid-January of 2018, SB 25, Senate Bill 2571 was born. And SB 2571, it would ban the sale of sunscreens containing oxybenzone and octanoxate starting January 1st, 2021. And it was truly a team effort to get SB 2571 passed into law in 2018. And there were many uh, key stakeholders uh, involved with the passage um, and all of them had a role, their part and their responsibility. Dr. Downs had a big hand in helping to establish the scientific evidence that this bill was needed. And his evidence, as you know, indicates that these chemicals induce coral bleaching, harm and kill coral lar larvae by creating gross deformities and act as an endocrine disruptor. And in addition, um, members of the um, HIROC, Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition, uh, such as Ted Bolin, um, the Friends of Hanauma Bay, Sierra Club, Surfrider Foundation, and scientists such as Dr. Downs and UH's Dr. Robert Richmond they were key to the bill's passage into law. Now, was it smooth sailing for SB 2571? Did it just sail through the legislature? Not a chance. As with all things, there's always different perspectives. 
So those who had opposing perspectives to SB 2571 included groups such as the Personal Care Products Council, Retail Merchants of Hawaii, the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii, the Consumer Healthcare Products Association, the Hawaii Medical Association, and the Hawaii Food Industry Association. So, you know, ultimately, in my opinion, we, we were all trying to do what we thought was best. So I don't hold anything against those who oppose the bill. Uh, personally, I always make sure to listen and to understand where everyone is coming from um, and what's their rationale. But for this particular bill, you know, the trade association, group, trade association groups, they simply did not want these chemicals to be banned from sunscreen. While HMA, uh, Hawaii Medical Association, they expressed concerns about skin cancer. And believe me, I got an earful. I uh, distinctly remember one lady, she called the office and started yelling at me, Senator Gabbard, don't you mind if people get skin cancer? And my staff was, <laughs> you okay, boss? <laughs> um, both Bayer and Estee Lauder, um, the cosmetic industry, they had boots on the ground lobbyists that were knocking on doors at the state capitol, making their rounds to speak with legislators. But in the end, after much drama, the main thing the lobbyists wanted was more time in terms of the effective date, because the effective date on the original bill was January 1st, 2019. And so, however, it seemed that uh, if we pushed that to January 1st, 2021, that that worked for them. And that's how that came to be. It was a compromise with the cosmetic industry to give them more time to adjust their product line. So SB 2571 is a big step forward for the protection of our coral reefs marine life and human health. It was the first law passed not only in this country, as I mentioned, but in the world to ban sunscreens that contain those two dangerous chemicals, oxybenzone and octanoxate. And to my knowledge, I believe that Palau, Aruba, Bonaire, the US Virgin Islands, uh, Marshall Islands, uh, part of Mexico, and also the city of Key West, Florida, they followed our suit. But remember, Hawaii was the first. So just to be clear, um, our oxybenzone and octanoxate ban is a ban on sales. So it would be a restriction placed solely on the retailer in Hawaii. And as you're aware, it doesn't restrict tourists from bringing in their own sunscreen products for personal use. And no, uh, this came up again during the bill, during the hearings, there won't be pe uh, beach police roaming the local beaches asking to see your tube of sunscreen and writing you a ticket if you're not in compliance. Um, the onus is not on the tourist or citizen, but it's on the retailers. And so SB 2571, when it passed into law and became Act 104 in 2018, we had uh, several years before the implementation date of January 1st, 2021. And during those interim years, things were moving along quite well. Uh, NOAA released a study in August of 2019 that gauged educational efforts related to awareness of the impacts of sunscreen chemicals on coral reefs. And what they found about 75% of the people surveyed said that they were aware of certain chemicals being harmful to corals. Now, the researchers also found that around 92% of Hawaii residents were aware of the effects of oxybenzone and octanoxate on coral. 75% uh, of surveyed visitors from the US mainland said they were aware. And around 63% of international visitors told researchers that they had heard of these issues. Also, the uh, Kohala Center announced in May of this year that oxybenzone levels have dropped dramatically at Hawaii Island's uh, Kahulu'u Bay. The uh, Kohala Center's ongoing uh, reef-friendly sun protection campaign has resulted in oxybenzone levels dropping 93% or more at water sampling sites in the Bay between the start of the campaign in April, 2018 and November, 2019. So with oxybenzone and octanoxate addressed, we have set our course towards avabenzone and octocrylene. So this past 2021 session, which ended in, uh, near the end of April, I introduced, as Darla mentioned, SB 366, which would make it unlawful to sell, offer for sale, or distribute for sale in the state any sunscreen that contains avobenzone or octocrylene, 
without a prescription issued by a licensed healthcare provider. And for the bill, I worked closely with Ted Boland, Lisa Bishop, and surprise, surprise, Dr. Craig Downs. Um, for those who may not know, um, avobenzone and octocrylene are two other dangerous chemicals that harm marine life and human health. Unfortunately, we weren't able to move SB 366 uh, across the finish line. However, we were able to put our efforts into another bill, SB Senate Bill 132. And that was passed by the Senate, crossed over to the House, which is a big step, but it was unable to, uh, to pass in the House. So hopefully we'll have better success next session. Okay, so as far as next steps, um, I do plan on reintroducing um, SB 132 in 2022. Uh, this issue, uh, just to lay all the cards on the table, it's gonna be an issue that will be around for a while. And in case you don't know, uh, kind of insider information, sometimes it takes five or six years for good bills to pass into law. That's what I love about my job. It teaches me patience, but it also teaches me determination. Uh, in February, 2019, the FDA circulated a proposed uh, thing called a tentative final monograph, which documented the FDA's current perspective on FDA regulations. And most notably in this tentative final monograph, the FDA asserted that only two ingredients, zinc oxide, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide had established sufficient safety and efficacy to be warranted as category one or generally recognized as safe and effective. And the acronym is GRASC, G-R-A-S-C. Now, other than a few ingredients that the FDA listed as banned, all other chemical filter ingredients for sunscreen were determined to be category three and requiring additional data before they could be, they could be considered on the GRASC list, approval list. So the FDA, they're expected to publish a new administrative order to clarify their final position on sunscreens in the fall of this year. And I know that many of are waiting for the results of another report coming out, uh, it's the fall of next year, 2022, uh, from the National Academy of Sciences that may stall legislative efforts regarding banning dangerous sunscreen chemicals next session. But that doesn't mean that we can't still try our best in getting this very important legislation passed. You know, I can already hear it now. Let's wait till the next study comes out in 2022. So in addition, I would also like to take this time to announce a very special bill that Dr. Downs and I have been working on for next session. And we both wanted to share this exciting news with you tonight. You heard it first here um, at this event hosted by the uh, Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. So with the help and support of many people across and beyond our state, uh, we were able to get Act 104 passed in 2018. And hopefully this key piece of legislation I'm about, that I'm about to share with you will be able to do just that this next session, which begins in mid-January. So what Dr. Downs and I have been working on, will, it will be focused, the bill will be focused on conservation and eliminating chemical pollution. It was in 2019, a brave heroine by the name of Mendy Dent of Fairwind Cruises located on Hawaii Island. Uh, she led an extraordinary effort that ultimately convinced the Hawaii state, the LNR, to issue new requirements for Kealakekua Bay special permit holders of new reef safe sunscreen and human waste requirements. So since January 1st, 2019, sunscreen containing oxybenzone, octanoxate, octosalate, avobenzone, octocrylene, homosalate, and nanoparticles are not allowed in the bay. Only reef safe sunscreens that contain ingredients such as zinc, zinc oxide, and or titanium dioxide are allowed. Now, what Mendy did was a big win for our coral reefs, our environment, and our precious Hawaii Nei. But what we wanna do is take that success that came at Kealakekua Bay, make it official and build upon that momentum further. So the bill that Dr. Downs and I have been working on for next session will ban chemical sunscreens in four major marine life conservation districts or MLCDs. And they are at Kealakekua Bay on the Big Island, Honolulu on Maui, Manele at 
Nunai, Holokini, and then the Ahihi Nature Reserve here in Maui. So we're still working out the details, but we thought that this would be a perfect venue to unveil what we plan to do in 2022. And so with your help, input, and support, this bill might end up on the governor's desk and signed into law, just like our sunscreen bill did in 2018. I'll continue to work with Dr. Downs, uh, Ed Bolin, Lisa Bishop, and the rest of the Hawaii Reef and Ocean Coalition, as well as other stakeholders such as yourselves, to do whatever it takes in coming up with solutions to best address this critical issue that we're facing today. So to wrap it up, as you can see, and everything that's been shared with you today by Dr. Downs and myself, we cannot do this alone. It's, what's the Hawaiian word, laulima, right? Many hands and many minds and many hearts to create the change that we wish to see. Uh, a change for a better today and for an even better tomorrow. So events like we're having today are very important because it's bringing awareness to the problem and getting people involved is huge. I always recommend that people contact the members of the legislature, especially in your district. Uh, you know, that can be phone calls, emails, letters, social media posts, uh, the list goes on and on. However, the most effective way to affect change regarding legislation is to submit testimony for the committee hearing when the legislation is heard, and even better, be there in person or remotely when the hearing is being held. We've had groups like Surfrider Foundation organize students from the elementary level all the way up to college to come in and testify in person. And this is always good. Imagine a sixth grader sitting there in the hearing testifying. And I've looked over at some of my members on my agriculture environment committee and the tears are coming down the faces as the sixth graders telling the importance of taking care of the Aina and taking care of our oceans. So creating that groundswell of support, that's what gets bills passed. Now, um, Anne informed me yesterday of Maui Council Member Kelly King's bill uh, that would amend the Maui County Code to prohibit the sale, use, or distribution of oxybenzone and octanoxin. I'm excited about this. And, but this is a perfect example, an opportunity to get involved and to get your voice heard. Hawaii is home to us all. You have a say in what happens here in paradise. So I wanna thank again, the Maui Nui Marine Resource Council for inviting me to share my mana'o with you this evening, as well as to Dr. Downs and all of you for all that you do for our Hawaii. Aloha and mahalo. Well, boy, thank you so much, Senator Gabbard and for your whole volume of, of work in this area and in, for the environment. Uh, and both Dr. Downs and Senator Gabbert will be taking your questions now. And I wanted to remind you to put those in the Q&A so I can see them. I don't want to miss anyone. And if you're watching this uh, presentation on Facebook, you can put questions in the comment section. Uh, and then our, our team will transfer them over to me. So we, we have had some questions come in. Um, the first one that came in kind of early that says, do you think that it's sunscreen or we just need to stop so many people and over tourism and overcrowded beaches? Even if all those people were wearing zero sunscreen, don't you think it would still have a negative impact on the reefs? The question is directed at me. You know what? Take it, let's, Greg. let's go with that. <laughs> um, I, I think the impact would be greatly reduced. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because um, there's there's some areas where, uh, for example, in Palau, you, you still get a lot of people coming into some of their coral reefs, that they're coming into Jellyfish Lake. And when you don't have that pollution factor, you have a healthy ecosystem. Right. Um, so it's it's something as simple and what looked to be innocuous is as sunscreen, if you can remove it or come up with a, a safer means um, for both people and for the environment, um, you, you can, again, um, have a particular carrying capacity of tourists into an area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And, um, you know, we do have a, a couple of questions that I think uh, I'd like to ask Senator Gabbard to address. 
Uh, Sherry asks, what does oxybenzone do to our body? I know uh, we started to go into that and it really had an impact when I was listening because it, you know, in addition to the coral reefs, uh, you know, more awareness of the chemicals we put on our body is really impactful. So what, what are your thoughts there, Senator Gabbard? My thoughts are this. You're looking at the expert that I went to for all the scientific evidence. We're going to go to Dr. Downs on this. As far okay. As well. <laughs> I'm not punting, but I, I want you to hear back, from the source. Back to you, Dr. Downs. <laughs> all right. So, so, so oxybenzone can be dangerous, uh, especially to pregnant persons. So uh, especially persons in their, in their first trimester. Um, it was actually the Chinese that that first discovered this is that oxybenzone, when a pregnant person is exposed in the first trimester, um, the baby can be born with a birth defect called Hirschsprung's deformity. And um, the rumor is, is that the Chinese looked into this because they were seeing such high levels of Hirschsprung's disease in many of their cities. And one of the, the, the major chemicals that their epidemiologists um, saw as a problem was oxybenzone being in their water. It was in their seafood. Um, it was in their vegetables. Um, and it was the Chinese that discovered that um, a lot of their hydroponics and irrigated agriculture, uh, they were using sewage. Uh, it's called R1 water from, from waste uh, water treatment systems. Um, it could be a good way of using less industrial fertilizers, but at the same time, it's loaded with pharmaceuticals and, and sunscreen chemicals and personal care product chemicals. And so they were seeing a cumulative exposure, not just from sunscreens that they apply to their skin. Um, you know, there are a number of studies showing that it causes, uh, that it's associated with endometriosis in women. So women that use a lot of oxybenzone sunscreen uh, they see higher incidence of endometriosis. Um, they, they found epidemiolo epidemiological uh, evidence that it causes uh, preterm births. So it causes a number of early stage development uh, uh, diseases. And that is completely consistent with what we see in the ecotoxological eco data. Coral planula are much, much more susceptible to the toxic effects of oxybenzone than adult coral. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with fish. Uh, fish. Fish larvae are about a thousand times more susceptible. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, um, I won't let my children swim in public swimming pools because we know for a fact that oxybenzone levels and other sunscreen chemicals are can be incredibly high. Mm -hmm. and, you have a full body immersion and absorption of these chemicals um, when, you, when you get into a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. So the, the best thing to do is just not have them. Right. There, there's a, a few places uh, around Maui that I wouldn't suggest either. Uh, you, you know, a couple of people have brought up uh, enforcement. You know, we, we've talked about legislation and creating these, you know, wonderful bills that, that you know, hopefully we can get more uh, passed. But um, uh, Christy mentioned that she still sees uh, almost every store in Maui that sells sunscreen having sunscreen products with, with oxybenzone. So how, how do we address that? Um, one thing, and I know some people are already doing this, the next time you're in a store and you're in the sunscreen section, take out your, your phone, take a picture, and um, send a nice little email with the picture to the owner of the store saying you were breaking the law. And go back and check, be nice, you know, and also send a copy to me, send it to law enforcement. And uh, let them know that you're sending the, the store owner that who you're sending it to, and give them a reasonable amount of time, or maybe maybe to, to answer your email, and um, go from there. Mm -hmm. And again, I think you know, I mean, there's been enough time since January 1st, right, to be in compliance with this thing, mm -hmm. right? So people are doing this knowingly, uh, so they need to. And, and once that hits the media, such and such a store got 
You know, and I think I saw, Craig, you had an idea about, um, you know, the state filing a, loss, a lawsuit against the store, right? And that <laughs> we're not complying. Was that, is, that what, is that what you were thinking of, Craig? Yeah, yeah not in compliance, but also, um, you know, every business has to have business insurance. Right. And if, if a business is not in compliance with state and federal <laughs> and local laws, then does their policy hold? Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. you, can, you can bet those insurance premiums, <laughs> if they refuse to comply with the law, are going to go skyrocket, or you're going to lose your, and you're going to be searching for a new insurance company. So what department would that fall under for enforcement? <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons why it was not in the bill. Uh, none of the departments, DLNR, D Department of uh, Health, um, nobody wanted to, <laughs> because it means money, uh, getting officers to go around to, you know, to enforce it. So it means appropriations, additional money. Um, into the budget. And so that's why that's, it you know, seems like it would be in the DLNR or I don't know, maybe Department of Health. Mm -hmm. But we're, uh, you know, we're willing to address that issue again this next session, mm -hmm. if we need to, if, if some good solutions come up. You know, Darla, sometimes people think that the 76 legislators, we all sit down there and rack our brains and come up with all these ideas to introduce bills. So many of the bills, the, the great bills that have passed, come from the people. Mm -hmm. um, who have ideas come from people like Craig Downs. We said, "Why don't you take a look at this?" And, and you know, and I can't tell you how many times during those hearings it went on, where I was able to say, "Let's look at the science," right? Right. Because every you know everybody else was saying, you know, the 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 industry, the cosmetic industry, and all the various groups that I named, they were saying, "No, no, you can't do this. You can't do this." Once you say, let's look at the science, and then you quote from the science, then mm -hmm. all, there's silence from the other side. Well, it's encouraging that you are still looking at enforcement. I, I think taking a, yeah. a cue from the illegal short-term rental experience, uh, you know, if you don't put money towards enforcement, it doesn't have a lot of oomph behind it. So uh, it's good, good to hear that you're still looking at that. Um, so I know we're, we're going to actually get into this a, a little bit um, at the end from Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, but uh, either one of you want to chime in a little bit about best ideas to educate visitors on sunscreens or the recommendation to wear sun shirts, and et cetera? Um, I mean, some of the best ideas come from um, resource managers like Jeff Bagshaw at DLNR. Mm -hmm. um, he came up with, with some great signage. He's come up with some really good ways for his volunteers to engage. You know, every tourist that shows up at HE from 8.30 to 3.30 uh, during the day. Um, I, I think there, there's, a, there's a critical need for creative thinking when it comes to social social media outlets, mm -hmm. how do we how do we get influencers on TikTok and Instagram to to spread the spread the message? Um, how do we get surfers that live in Hawaii to spread the message with with all their fans? Um, Hollywood types and rock stars. I mean, it, it doesn't some doesn't somebody from the band Aerosmith lives right next to a hee hee. And sometimes you can see him in his board shorts and his, his, his water right in front of his house is really mm. polluted with sunscreen. Right. Um, so if we can get uh, residents to, to also engage, I, I think that would be quite helpful. Okay. I also think uh, travel agencies, people that are selling the tickets to the folks that are coming here, you know, they should, they should be feel responsible, responsible to take part in this education effort. Right. Mm -hmm. Not just, right. you know, Tourists come here and they say, oh, I never heard this before. I know that the airlines and the hotels have stepped up to the plate mm -hmm. uh, to educate the tourists. So uh, it's going to take an all-out effort from everyone, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so another question came in about what other care products have oxybenzone. I, I, you know, I think, can we take the leap that there's a lot of products that people are putting on their skin that have these and other chemicals that are very harmful? 
Uh, yes, so, so moisturizers, uh, there will be SPF moisturizers. Uh, the anti-aging cream, uh, that market is about six times the size larger than the sunscreen market. Hmm. Um, and, and many of those anti-aging creams will contain actinosate, octinoxate, hmm. uh, aquacrylene. Uh, some of them will also contain oxybenzone. Uh, we see a lot of shampoos and conditioners containing oxybenzone, actinosate. Um, and again, if, uh, I, I know some people who put conditioner in their hair before they go sn snorkeling because they have really long curly hair and they don't want it to snarl. Mm -hmm when they're swimming in. And, and so again, that could be a source of, of the sunscreen pollution, not just from sunscreen products, beach products, but again, from conditioner shampoos and other personal care products. The other issue is Hawaii has a really bad um, time with uh, modern wastewater treatment systems. Mm -hmm. So many homes are on cesspits. Uh, there's a lot of uh, homes that are on, on septic septic does not pull out these chemicals and so they will like cesspits that are overflow uh, they'll they'll leach right into the ocean so having an advanced wastewater treatment system that will remove these chemicals not just sunscreens but other pharmaceuticals um, from um, you know the affluent discharges from the wastewater treatment system is going to be critical mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I kind of hang out a lot over in the Kapalua and the Pili region. And, um, you know, they had problems with their sewage line um, leaking. Mm -hmm. uh, and we would notice it in Honakiana Cove. We would notice it in the Pili and, and Kapalua. And um, Maui County Council um, did a stand-up job um, putting money towards renovating and, and putting new lines in. And I'm excited to have COVID end so I can get back there and resample that water to see how effective it is. But I have uh, friends and, and relatives saying that the water has really cleaned up. Um, so mm -hmm. just that can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Modernizing the wastewater treatment system um, could be big for all of Hawaii. Right. Well, and I, I know that uh, there was some data that uh, the sunscreen ban is helping already. And I believe, Senator Gabbard, you mentioned that there's going to be further work to ban additional chemicals. Yes. Well, the one that didn't pass this last year, as I mentioned, we'll be reintroducing it this next year. We'll take a look at it. And then if it needs to be tweaked, again, we'll seek uh, Dr. Down's advice and, and talk to other uh, stakeholders, because again, as I was mentioning, it's it's we welcome input, and then we are able to check, and then that's how you come up with good bills, right? Right, Craig? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, and spreading the word like this, uh, sharing your your time, which we really appreciate. Um, I did want to move on to a related topic before we close about education. The newest report from Hawaii Tourism Authority reports that during the month of May, Maui had 58,412 visitors on any given day on Maui. Maui Nui Marine Resource Council recognizes the importance of educating those visitors to teach them how to protect our coral reefs while they enjoy their time at our beaches. And that includes educating them about reef harming sunscreen chemicals. We're particularly grateful to our Maui County Council, Mayor Victorino and the County of Maui Mayor's Office of Economic Development for including support for visitor education programs in the 2020, 2021, and 2022 county budgets. Last June, Maui Nui Marine Resource Council installed coral reef signs at 39 of Maui's beaches and other shoreline areas. These signs included messages about avoiding sunscreens with reef harming oxy, uh, oxybenzone and aquatinoxate. MNMRC also installed large scale window displays in the southwestern terminal of Kahului Airport about protecting coral reefs and making the right sunscreen choices. Now that visitors are returning in large numbers, 
MNMRC has launched a targeted social media campaign and electronic display ad campaign presenting coral reef conservation and sunscreen messages to visitors while they're here on Maui. MNMRC is also running radio spots for the next 10 weeks on all of Maui's radio stations and a special mahalo to Waterman Archie Kalepa for recording these educational radio ads about making the right sunscreen choices. MNMRC has a website page devoted to sunscreen information at mauireefs.org slash sunscreen. We know that people don't want to carry around a lot of paper and MNMRC doesn't want to give away a lot of big paper brochures. So they've made this really cool small printed reference card. It's about the size of a business card that has all the information about it. And these cards are available in quantities for distribution for free to Maui concierge, retail shops, and other outlets that interact with visitors. MNMRC is also running some print ads in visitor magazines this summer and fall. All of these outreach efforts help support MNMRC's work for clean ocean water, healthy coral reefs, and abundant native fish. Other MNMRC programs include working for cleaner ocean water in Ma'alaya Bay through a project using caged oysters to remove sediment from the water and efforts to uh, prevent sediment and stormwater runoff from the Po'okea watershed to keep brown water out of the bay. MNMRC is also co-founder and co-manager with the Nature Conservancy, Conservancy and West Maui Ridge to Reefs Initiative on a unique community-based ocean water quality monitoring program, uh, which tests ocean water quality at 29 locations in South and West Maui every three weeks. MNMRC is also testing LIMU to identify the sources of nitrogen pollution at several of our beaches. To accomplish this work, hey, you know, that's a lot of work. <laughs> MNMRC needs your support. Donate to them at MauiReefs.org. And when you do, you can choose a free gifts. And you can see some of those there. Uh, you can also support MNMRC by shopping via Amazon Smile. Doesn't cost you anything. You just go through Amazon Smile, and a uh, percentage of all your purchase price goes to Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. So please save Wednesday, August 4th on your calendar for the next Know Your Ocean Speaker Series event, which will focus on Hawaiian monk seals. You can view all of MNMRC's past speaker series events on YouTube on the Maui Reefs channel. And you can share tonight's talk on Facebook. Just visit facebook.com slash MNMRC. Please tune in to my radio show this Sunday morning. You'll hear bits of these interviews today. You can share with, with your friends and family. And last but not least, we wanted to thank some of our corporate sponsors of MNMRC. And thank you so much for our two wonderful guest speakers and for all of you participating with us, joining us. And please help get the word out about sunscreen choices. They do make a difference for our coral reefs. And as we learned tonight, really a, a big impact on your body as well. So you can you know, have two great causes and making those great sunscreen choices. So I really wanted to thank you both so much and for joining us. The presentations were incredibly informative and thank you. Aloha, Darla. Aloha, Craig. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Downs. Thanks, Senator Gabbard. Thank Good night. Good night. Good night.